guys, welcome back to the Strong Sisters YouTube channel. In today's video, I had the great pleasure to chat with Danny Roddy about health and simple ways to assess whether or not your current nutrition strategy is working for you. So we specifically talk about how to assess one's thyroid and metabolism, and there are multiple ways to achieve a healthy thyroid and a healthy metabolism. And so I hope this conversation helps you assess whether or not what you are doing right now, nutritionally, lifestyle-wise, is working for you and your health. There are multiple ways to achieve health. However, following diet rules won't necessarily get you there. So always pay attention to what your body is trying to tell you. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button to stay tuned for future videos. And I hope you guys enjoy the conversation. All right. Hi, Danny. Thanks so much for hopping on the Strong Sisters channel. How are you doing today? Total pleasure. Thank you for having me, Ash. Uh, it, always good to be here. Yeah. So I'm excited to talk first a little bit about kind of what is health, because I think that that definition is really lost um, in all the different diet spheres. Everyone, it just seems like we talked about this beforehand. Some doctors and some influencers are kind of like lost since they don't have a central definition of what is health. And so they just go by what the literature says. And we all know the literature is kind of hard to weed through, right? Um, so I think if we can kind of start with a definition of what is health, and definitely, I think both of us now view health in the repeat bioenergetic pro-metabolic lens, right? Um, so I think that'd be a great starting point. Yeah, what a, what a huge question, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how to define it per se, but maybe having the orientation of a young child being excited uh, to be alive, being resistant to highly negative people, you know, that surround us every day, uh, it, it, be, having a high temperature, a high pulse rate, like a young child, maybe an adolescent, a 10 year old or something. I don't know how many healthy adolescents there are these days, but uh, maybe if we go back to the 1950s or so pre the, the thing that's going on right now, we'd, we'd have more uh, highly functioning adolescents, but um, uh, not having good digestion, having a healthy, satisfactory libido, not ruminating on negative thoughts or negative interactions with people and, and just having kind of like a toxic mindset that you're always thinking about negative things, projecting yourself into the future and thinking what you do rather than thinking about the past and things like that. Those are all just like types of things that I've monitored for myself, you know, um, over my whole uh, health journey. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think the child, the healthy child resembles uh, best equates like what is health. And so monitoring them and seeing how they act would probably be the best proxy for, for health or what, however you want to define it. Yeah. I think um, in all these different like diet spheres, there's kind of like these rules, diet rules, where if you don't follow those diet rules, then you aren't necessarily healthy. So just as an example, like if you don't do 16, eight for fasting, <laughs> you're, you're not healthy, right? Like, health equals fasting or, or certain things like that. I, I used to think this way and yeah. it took a lot to untrain myself, but, but those are diet rules. That, that is not a measure of being healthy. And I think that that is, that's like in all different spheres. So like, as an example, as a vegan, not eating meat is healthy. Or as a carnivore, not eating plants is healthy. And it's just, no, these are rules. These are not objective measures of yourself. Um, so I, I wrote down a few more. I, I like yours. So like basically good as a child, you have good stable energy. You have a good happy mood. Um, you aren't necessarily focused on the negatives or kind of like uh, criticizing others, I guess. <laughs> it's, you've seen a lot these days, right? Um, but I, I wrote down a few others. So good hormones. Obviously, I think it's important to get your hormone panels tested. Um, for females, that's a lot easier having a, a good functioning period. Mm -hmm. um, having a good libido. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's missing a lot from a lot of spheres. I know that that was negatively affected for myself when I was doing a lot of fasting and a lot of low carb. Um, and then you talk a lot about this, but having good, thick, luscious hair <laughs> is, is a sign of health as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I, that's kind of why I got into all this stuff and which led me to the whole stress paradigm or the bioenergetic or the repeat or whatever you want to call it. You know, um, I don't, it's like a 45 minute story, but a long time ago, somebody said, 
hey, you know what? This whole DHT, like for males, if, if you're losing your hair, you're inundated with the idea that genetics and a hormone called DHT are responsible for hair loss. And so a long time ago, a person on a forum who everybody held in high regard was like, this story seems uh, wrong. It, it seems like a pharmaceutical, like Merck invention. And, and he was saying there are other hormones involved in pattern baldness, like um, estrogen and prolactin, another one called aldosterone, like a whole array of hormones. And I have no idea why this was like 2005 or 2006. And I was like, I don't know why this guy seems right. It's not like I had any science background to like think that he was right. It just inherently kind of made more sense. Yeah. So anyways, long story short, like um, I was, I went from like vegetarian to vegan to uh, like low carb paleo in like 2007, zero carb a la Sean Baker, 2008 and nine. Um, and then Paul Jaminet, he wrote a book called like The Perfect Health Diet, and there was Popular to Eat Starches for, for a while. And then I finally found Ray. And anyways, Ray's beautiful picture of physiology, all the things he's building that he's been building since like the, the 70s. You know, I think Nutrition was nutrition for Women, one of his books was, was written in like 1973. And if you read that book, it is still excellent. <laughs> like all the things are highly applicable to like all the things we're going to talk about. And so... Um, yeah, so I, I guess I'm trying to say like he just had this framework for approaching health problems that I think has uh, lasted, you know, where we we're just talking about how people are like jumping from paradigm to paradigm and, and there's no direction. Everybody's confused about what's going on. And in my point of view, Ray just has this rock solid foundation of this uh, energy reinforces structure and vice versa thing. The, the thing he says on his the front of RayPete.com and it's not even his. You know, Albert St. Georgie, Otto Warburg, a bunch of other people had this similar type of uh, energy consciousness about health. Uh, Albert St. Georgie said uh, a cell needs uh, energy for all of its functions, but also to maintain its structure. So if you think a healthy cell needs to reinforce its like cytoskeleton structure and cells form tissues and tissues form organs and organs form you, I think that's a great way of uh, approaching health problems as minor as constipation or bad mood or depression or something to... Um, anything else from heart disease to cancer to Alzheimer's to whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you brought up some more there. So, um, digestion, like you mm -hmm. said, you should have good digestion. You should be pooping every single day. Um, Mo maybe that, multiple times. Per day. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, and with that comes like being able to digest foods. Yeah. It, it almost seems like, and I was this way, it almost seems like there's bragging rights for like, no, no, no. Like I, I, I can't eat, I can't eat that. Like I, I can only eat this. <laughs> and it, it's like, it's a good thing to not be able to digest certain foods. And I, I had that mindset too, that it's okay to be like really, really um, like my gut to be compromised such that I can only di digest these foods. Right now, I still do have a compromised gut. I'm working on things. We had that mold exposure. And so I don't tolerate starches as well. I do well mm -hmm. with potatoes, but like, mm -hmm. I tried like einkorn sourdough bread um, and that led to like some constipation and some gut mm -hmm. issues. So mm -hmm. I think having a like robust gut and being able to tolerate foods, not necessarily eating junk food, like no one is saying that, but being able to digest food in general is a good, good thing. hundred percent. The bet, my favorite example that is like, um, well, I, just for in my own life, but like when I was transitioning off of carnivore, I basically couldn't digest anything. I had like chronic diarrhea for a long time. Yeah. And, and, and it, that it was especially bad when I introduced milk into the equation. And I lived in Southern California. I had access to like six different brands of raw milk and I tried them all and all of them gave me horrible stomach upset. It would have been so easy for me to say, you know what? Milk is a species inappropriate food. Nobody should drink it. You know, I could have just stopped right there. Yeah. But the tr The truth was I was a complete mess. You know what I mean? And so obviously that gets into a sticky situation of like, oh, well, why don't you feel that way about seed oils or something? But I, but I think there are seriously harmful, risky foods and, and, and a lot of benign foods that people kind of dismiss. And I, I milk is, is something that gets put into that category of people d dismissing it very quickly. But um, again, given Ray's confidence of how useful and kind of um, benign it was, and I couldn't digest it. That made me ex extremely interested in why I couldn't digest it rather just than just throwing it in a pile of foods that I could never tolerate. And therefore I will never eat again. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you bring up a like it's legitimate to have intolerance to dairy. 
-hmm. but you can work on certain things. There, there's evidence that you can work on certain things to improve that tolerance. That's true. But, but for example, dairy is one of like the most adulterated foods you could possibly find in the grocery store. If you look, if you take a cheese and you look at the back of the box or, or package or whatever, it's going to have like enzymes, cultures, uh, microbial rennet or vegetable rennet. And if you have a sensitive stomach or something, those are going to uh, really, really uh, throw a wrench into things. And so it, yeah. it, it just, it doesn't speak about diet paradigms. It speaks to how toxic our food supply is and how oh, yeah. these like government agencies that are supposed to be regulating them are a complete joke. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you bring up a good point. We don't, we don't want to be able to digest like almond milk and oat milk <laughs> and like undercooked vegetables and beans and things like that. But having like a relatively diverse diet and being able to um, enjoy certain foods that you like that are within boundary, like not saying like Tootsie, like pops and th random things, like random things like that. But um, having good digestion, which also leads to like good skin because your skin is a reflection of your digestion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we kind of covered on, I don't know, most of the health topics. I, I think it's important, like people should use these objective measures to determine whether or not what they're using or doing for a nutrition strategy is working for them. Um, yeah. And, and, and like you said, people get sucked into different kind of stories about health. And so even and I know you and I both experienced, but even if your health is like falling apart and you can't even see it, like you're blind to it, you know, because yeah. you've accepted the story that the diet guru has sold, you know? Right. And so like I, when I was vegan, I had shrunk down to like 120 pounds and my family wanted to have like an intervention for me because I, <laughs> I thought I looked so terrible. And, and, but I was still like totally in the mindset that I was fine, you know? And yeah. so it, it's that high cortisol is probably deteriorating my brain, like uh, my, my view of self-image and things like that. And so if you're in a, <laughs> if you're in a, a bad place, you know, your, your orienta orientation towards the world and yourself is probably extremely skewed. And so it might be very hard to dig yourself out of that type of hole. One, one more that I want to add to this is um, whether you have like a binge and restriction pattern. So like you have to stay super strict in order to fit your like diet regimen, but then it's really easy for you to go off the rails and have like these huge binge sessions. And then you have to go back to being really strict. Like that's just a very unhealthy pattern and is a very clear sign that whatever you're doing isn't working for you. Your body is not satisfied for whatever vitamin, mineral, or macronutrient wise. I, I love that. Sometimes when I'm talking to people on Zoom or Skype or whatever, they're like, uh, okay, so uh, when, uh, when do you cheat? You know, <laughs> and I'm like, I, it's really, I don't have much incentive to do that. One, because I feel satisfied by the foods I'm eating. And then I'm like, hey, I'm talking to Ashley tomorrow. I don't want to be like holding in diarrhea while talking to her. You right. know what I mean? Right. And so it's not, that's not even, that's not even attractive to do that. You know what I mean? And so maybe, maybe a person that only has had like seriously compromised health understands that orientation, but uh, like, uh, that's, that's how I feel. You know, I want to feel good as much as possible. The most of the time, you know, and I want to have less bad days, mostly good days. Right. And to me, that's just kind of um, eating a satisfactory diet, covering all my bases nutritionally and trying to keep the rate of metabolism up. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that was kind of like checkpoints that people can maybe like assess whether their current eating strategy is working for them. Um, notice we did not say weight loss. I think that that's, like, <laughs> that's an important thing to reflect on. I just realized that like people assume that like, okay, X, Y, Z diet led to weight loss thus good. And while if weight loss is your only goal, okay, that's, that's a great thing, but weight loss can be an extremely stressful process for someone, especially for someone who's relatively leaner. Um, and that's not necessarily always a reflection of health. hundred percent. I, 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 it might be one of the worst markers to determine somebody's health. You know, we were, again, we were talking before, um, I'd have to spend lots of time with somebody and talk to them and see how they viewed the world, how they acted when somebody cut in front of them at the grocery store line or, or whatever. Like there are so many better markers for health yeah. than weight to me. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I realized that is an extremely dominant view on internet health space. or what does a person look like? But I, I'm of the opinion that that is, you can't conclude the, the person's health. Like the, um, 
again, I, I've seen behind the curtain. I've talked to people with Adonis physiques or whatever the equivalent is for, uh, yeah. what is it? Uh, Aphrodite, like another Greek God or yeah. for a woman. I, people are su suicidal, you know, that have the best physiques I've ever seen. People are extremely depressed, can't sleep. You know, I've, I've seen it all, you know? And so again, I'm, I'm not saying a person should strive to be overweight or something, but I just don't think they're mutually exclusive. I don't, I, I, I've met heavier people that I thought were way healthier than people that were extremely lean or something. I just, that, that viewpoint has been eviscerated to me. It's just not, it's not uh, applicable these days. Yeah. And I don't think anyone should be obese or overweight, but I think it's always just important to keep in mind that when someone is super lean, they have to be sacrificing something. Um, I am case in point in this. I was super lean for most of my life and I did not have normal functioning periods. I, it was really hard for me to sleep well. And I had to do a lot of activity in order to maintain that, like give up a lot of other parts of my life and spend a lot of time in the gym in order to maintain a certain physique. And at the end of the day, like after reflecting, it's just like, for, for what reason? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. To impress your peers? I guess <laughs> impress so. the internet? <laughs> I guess so, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good point. I mean, uh, I mean, this gets even stickier. Did Dorothy talk about the obesity paradox or whatever? Yeah. The people that are more overweight are like less like, uh, more likely to survive like a dangerous surgery. I, it gets gets really mind bending, you know, and and again, a lot of the guys I talk to are young dudes losing their hair that are really lean. Yeah, I, I, I it's 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 really again, it's it's mind bending, like I said. Yeah. OK, so now we went over like check marks for what people can just like assess their like feelings, their day to day emotions, their day to day um, like um, like their gut and bowel movements and things like that, but what about actual measurements and tests? So let's start with like at-home tests, a super easy way to assess your thyroid and metabolism, which are two really important features of the repeat bioenergetic pro-metabolic nutrition strategy and outlook. Um, so let's start with like at-home simple tests. Yeah, yeah. So Rhoda, uh, Rhoda Barnes wrote a book called Hypothyroidism, The Unsuspected Illness. And so anything here, if a person is interested, they should definitely check out that book. It's like $12. You can buy it online. But in that book, he says, uh, Brody says, uh, under the armpit upon waking, a person should be uh, not under 97.8. And he, he thought if that was lower than that or 36.6 degrees Celsius, that was indicative of hypothyroidism. And usually there are many symptoms that go along with that, maybe like morning edema or just feeling like uh, you got hit by a bus during the nighttime or something. Um, and so that would be a good uh, indicator. And then the spice that Ray adds to that is the, the pulse rate. And so Broda mentioned it a few times during that, that book, but uh, Ray is kind of famous for one of his articles saying that he thought an optimal pulse was around 85 beats per minute in the afternoon with an uh, afternoon temperature of around 98.6. And so, so, okay, so Broda 97.8 uh, and under upon waking was indicative of lower thyroid function. And the thyroid, to my understanding, has a circadian rhythm, so it's highest in the afternoon. So it should rise to 98.6 in the afternoon, along with a higher pulse rate. This gets into a whole can of worms because most people are like, high pulse is terrible. You know, I feel so awful when my, my pulse is high. And I think that's from adrenaline, not from thyroid. And so when the thyroid is low, sometimes the adrenaline is extremely high, and that can ca cause the pulse to be like 90 or 100 or 110, 120. Yeah. And the best way I know of describing it is if you're, if you have a high temperature and a high pulse rate and you feel relaxed, I think that's the sign of a higher thyroid function. And if you have a lo slightly lower temperature, your hands and feet are cold. I, that, I didn't mention that. That was the important, one of the important things of health, the yeah. temperature of the hands and feet. Yeah. Um, that, uh, what was I saying? Okay. The, the core temperature being a little lower and the pulse rate being higher. I think that would be indicative of higher levels of cortisol and adrenaline. Yeah. And those compensate when the thyroid is low. So those are kind of like calling the shots when your thyroid is suppressed. And that's uh, evidence of higher pituitary activity, which could be demonstrated on actual lab tests. Yeah, I, so it's been a little bit over a year now. Um, I started measuring my waking body temperature mm -hmm. when I was zero carb, over exercising, super lean. Um, I'm embarrassed, but like my waking <laughs> temperature was like 96.4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that just like screams your thyroid needs help. You are doing a lot of damage. Um, but I, you brought up a great point. It's really important to measure both of those together. 
Um, it can be a little bit misleading if you just measure one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So when, when someone wakes up in the morning, get a uh, digital basal thermometer, they're not too expensive. Go on Amazon, uh, measure your temperature right when you wake up and then measure your pulse track yeah. that. Beautiful. The, the thing at the oral is a little bit higher than the underarm temperature. And so somebody might be like, Oh, my temperature is completely fine. My oral temperature. Oh, I did not know but, this. Yeah, it might be a degree or two difference between the two. Oh, wow. Okay. So do underarm with your thermometer um, and then <laughs> take those, like take both of those tests throughout the day. Yeah. Um, so as like frequent measurements. And like you said, your temperature should rise throughout the day as your thyroid kind of, yeah. Yeah, I think it's lower in the morning naturally, lower in the evening naturally. Yeah. Uh, and then it should be high in this afternoon. And then the other thing I say, this can be a little bit misleading sometimes, but measuring your pulse temperature when you feel absolutely awful, and then measuring it, say, when you're in a super good mood and seeing what the difference are, is. Oh, that's a good point. And then can't you use those measurements to kind of assess how your body is handling a certain food? Yeah, so you could even get more uh, kind of nitpicky with it. You could measure before and after a meal and things like that and, and figure yeah. out what was going on. It can get really confusing because uh, when I was vegan, I used to wake up like really hot and then I would eat, drink my green smoothie and my body temperature would like plummet and I'd become so cold. I, I'd have like hypothermia, basically my hands and feet would turn blue. Yeah. A and so I, I, what I'm trying to say is the nighttime stress can get so bad. The cortisol, I think, can get really high. Yeah. And uh, so, you know how, have you ever eaten a ton of protein and that really is like thermogenic and it warms you up? Danny, I did. OMAD or <laughs> and, and I was high protein carnivore. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I got to reflect on this because, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. So I would fast, right? And then I'd eat my meal, first meal, because fasting automatically equals health, right? Yeah. <laughs> so first meal at like 3 or 4 p.m. And then my last meal, like at 9 p.m. Between that period, I would fit 160 grams of protein in <laughs> with two meals. And so yeah. it's, it's like I was still really high fat too. Like I was over 220 grams of fat. I was high calorie, honestly, because mm -hmm. I was lean and working out a lot. Um, but I would notice a lot when I would push my protein, really high protein close to bed. Uh, I wake up hot in the middle of the night and I'd have really interrupted sleep. Yeah. I think that's evidence of higher estrogen, higher cortisol. Um, so I was trying to say, and that's, and that's a great anecdote, but like it can be a little bit misleading. So you wake up hot and you eat and um, sometimes your temperature can plummet, you know, but yeah. uh, where was I going with that? The, the cortisol can cannibalize your tissues or cannibalize and that can be like eating a high protein meal. So I, so, okay, this is what I was trying to say. When I woke up hot as a vegan, I think I was like consuming my own body. I was like eating a high protein meal during the night and that was a thermogenic process. Yeah. But when I would eat food and the cortisol would lower, it would reveal a devastatingly low basal metabolic rate. And so there yeah. are nuances to it. There are even nuances about like mood. Like people can get addicted to cortisol pills because it makes them feel so amazing. And I, and I suspect that's part of the success for a lot of people with carnivore and keto. Like running on stress hormones feels good sometimes, you know, at least for a certain phase of the stress response. And then like a lot of people completely bottom out and they feel absolutely terrible. And so- I, so again, I reached my wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> many, many people do, you know, and so. Okay, but, but again, what, what was in that green smoothie? Oh my God, it was like mustard greens and kale and the, it was stuff that I thought tasted like mustard greens and a, a, a smoothie tastes like awful. It has like this effervescent taste that like doesn't leave your mouth. It's really disgusting, but um, you know, anything for health. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. Okay. So then you're like, have you noticed any foods that cause you to have a decrease in body temperature? Um, if I like ate a, a bunch of protein or something, I didn't have carbohydrate with it. I would notice maybe an hour or two later, my, yeah. my temperature would probably decrease. Yeah. But to be honest, like, um, I, I take thyroid, you know, I've been taking thyroid for a long time yeah. and that I think has stabilized things. I used to get dramatic swings, you know, where I would be really cold or have, uh, have no symptoms and then have tons of symptoms like a few hours later. Yeah. And, and the credit I give to thyroid is that I think Broda Barnes wrote another book called hypoglycemia. It's not your mind, it's your liver. 
And in the book, whole book, he's just describing the thyroid's relationship with the liver and the yeah. thyroid needs T3 to be able to store glycogen or the glycogenolysis process or whatever it's called. And I, I just don't think, I think you're always susceptible to low blood sugar when your thyroid is low. Yeah. And so it's, again, it's always a matter of how a person wants to go about it. You can go try food things only, you can try supplements here and there, or jump into thyroid. It just totally depends on what a person specifically is interested in and feels comfortable with. But um, did, did somebody asked Ray one time about like solving the metabolic problems and he wrote something back and he's like, uh, increasing the rate of metabolism is his main thing. And there's many ways to do it. So there's a bunch of different methods. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's two, that's a really easy at home test to give you to assess whether whatever type of diet strategy you are following is working for your thyroid and your metabolism. Um, so what about some lab work? So if people were going to get some lab work done, what would you suggest for assessing, um, thyroid and metabolism? There's probably a bunch of different tests, you know, uh, I'm sure Georgie would have a long list, you know, my yep. favorites are TSH, total cholesterol, prolactin, vitamin D, parathyroid hormone, maybe lactic acid, reverse T3 and serum phosphorus. Okay. So those are a, a, a big problem that, you know, uh, I, I talk to a lot of people and they'll talk to their doctor. And if it, the tests are too boutique or extravagant, the doctor will just like instantaneously shut them down. Yeah. And I think that list, although doctors do shut down people, men, when they go ask for prolactin for some unknown reason, you know, because yeah. doctors are so incompetent, but the, uh, th those are fairly easy tests that are not extravagant that a person right. can get rel with relative ease. Yeah. And also the other thing I like about them is they kind of reinforce each other. For example, like the prolactin and parathyroid hormone have this relationship. There's a paper by another researcher named Raymond, and he says, basically they have a bi-directional relationship. And so what I'm trying to say is like, if your pro if your uh, prolactin came back a little bit lower, but your parathyroid hormone was super high, that would just kind of indicate, it, it would point a person in a good direction without getting misled by like one single test. And so, uh, yeah, in my limited experience, when people get those tests, there's always something to kind of point a person in a direction to go in. Yeah. And, and they're also actionable. Uh, like we were talking about, I don't know if you're recording, but like the super high cholesterol, 250 or 300 or even 200, you know, sometimes that can correlate very perfectly with hypothyroid symptoms. Yeah. And so again, a person could try to eat more calcium or something, which can turn over cholesterol into those protective steroids. They could take thyroid. It totally depends what they would want to do. Yeah, I think let's touch on cholesterol really quickly because uh, flashback a year ago, uh, we were emailing, Sarah and I were emailing Danny about um, cholesterol. And for anyone that's been following us for a while, Sarah and I were definitely what's termed lean mass hyper responders. <laughs> um, and I had a cholesterol close to 500. So this is LDL quote, bad cholesterol. I had LDL close to 500. Sarah was above 500. Um, and then after introducing carbohydrates, reducing exercise, um, it was about, I think four months in, I got my cholesterol levels rechecked and it dropped down to like 225. And so to me, that was like a huge sign that my thyroid had improved because Danny sent us all these papers, like literally a <laughs> huge list of papers from like what the forties and thirties, forties and fifties. There, there's a lot of I don't know what I, I forgot what yeah. I sent you, yeah. but there's it, any year you want, I'll send you a yeah. paper from like confirming that exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> he, he opened our eyes to high LDL cholesterol is very much a sign of hypothyroidism. Like there's, this has been well documented for in a number of papers. And it was shown by me introducing carbohydrates and improving my thyroid and metabolism that my cholesterol dropped in half within just a few months. Um, and can you share your story about accidentally overdosing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, let me comment on what was it? Yeah. Uh, hyper, that term is like, we have no idea why the, the cholesterol is high, the hyper responders. Like that's yeah. hilarious that low carb people need to invent a new term because they're so like confused on what drives up high cholesterol. Anyways. So, I mean, there's a paper by a guy named like Kenneth or something. And it's like in every situation when thyroid was administered, there was a sharp decline in, in, in uh, total cholesterol, along with an increase in the basal metabolic rate. And again, there's a paper from, I forgot the author, but it's like the Colorado something study where they say exactly the same thing. It's like in the 2000s, 
There's another paper by a guy named Duntis, which says the, the, the relationship between thyroid and cholesterol is not controversial. And anybody with eyes to see could go look, look up those papers or we can provide them in wherever. Um, but so, so I have like skin in the game, you know, and I've, I've experienced this firsthand. So when I was getting off carnivore uh, and introducing starches and then kind of transitioning to trying out the things Ray was suggesting, I uh, normally had, I had many lab tests, you know, and my cholesterol always ranged from like 200 to 220. And I uh, got a hold of some Sinoplus. So that's like my favorite uh, uh, thyroid brand. And long story short, each one of these pills is about two grains, 2.2 grains. But I thought it was one grain. I wanted to see what full replacement felt like. That's about four grains of thyroid. So I took four pills, but that's about, that's more than eight grains. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, that's like a monstrous dose of thyroid. So anyways, long story short, like when I was taking this for about like a week or two, I just started feeling terrible, you know? And one of the things I do whenever I do feel terrible or a long time ago when I had access to lab tests is I would simplify and then go get labs to see what was going on. Yeah. And my cholesterol, which I said was around 200 or 220, had dropped down to like 120. And having a low cholesterol is like associated with suicide and severe depression and all sort of digestive problems and all sorts of issues. And so- so I had, I had achieved that thyroid cholesterol relationship in the comfort of my own home by overdosing on thyroid. <laughs> yeah. But you bring up a great point. No one here is promoting like low cholesterol. Um, I think, like you said, low cholesterol has its own issues, low bad yeah. LDL cholesterol, like the mainstream um, health advice tells us we want to lower our LDL cholesterol as much as possible when there's actually a number of studies documenting, especially for elderly women, higher LDL cholesterol is, has improved mortality rates and improved prevention of certain chronic disease developments. Um, but 500 versus 200 is like a completely different story. And I think that just shows there's a lot of, I don't know, this is my thinking, there's a lot of extra cholesterol that isn't being converted into like hormones. Yeah, yeah. And so it aligns with my hormone issues that I was having. Like I didn't have proper sex hormones and that was likely a result that they, the cholesterol was not getting properly converted into them. I think that's a really excellent view of that. You know, Ray has even described it like the body is compensating for the lack of thyroid, like the best that it can. So it's producing cholesterol in a protective way. So I, I really don't mean to say that like in a vegan sense, oh, high cholesterol is bad. It's just a sign that your th thyroid is suppressed because uh, T3, I think vitamin A and LDL cholesterol are these cofactors for steroidogenesis and producing the pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA. So when a person's cholesterol is just climbing, it just means it, it suggests they're not producing lots of pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA. And those hormones are the crux of uh, uh, Ray's work. You know, this whole bioenergetic approach and resisting stress, those those hormones have just a myriad of different effects of opposing cortisol, estrogen, aldosterone, prolactin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think I used to believe that um, the high cholesterol as a lean mass hyper responder was because ketone, ketones and cholesterol had like the same, I don't know, pathway or something. <laughs> Someone who is really lean requires a higher ketone production and so like, because they're producing more ketones, they're producing more cholesterol because we don't have enough fat on our body to be able to use our fat for energy. So our, we had to produce more ketones, but I was never able to register over like 0.5 to one ketones on my blood meter. Um, because I was that that's a whole nother topic, but <laughs> reflecting back, like I really believed these other things and I thought that it was really okay. Um, and Again, no one is advocating for low cholesterol because like you said, cholesterol is protective. It has beneficial roles. Um, and tune into the interview with Georgie where he uh, debunks a lot of the cholesterol theories. It's um, There's very interesting arguments out there. And I, I really did believe it because I thought that what I was doing, again, diet rules, I was following diet rules. I thought that those equal health and thus I made my blood work what I wanted it to be to fit back to what I believed were the right diet rules, which were improving my health. That's the natural 
phenomena, you know, uh, try going through this journey, figure out what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Like I would never rob somebody of their own journey, you know, and, and not say to, Oh, do this because Ash and I had a conversation and, and therefore, you know, it's everybody's going through and learning at, at different rates, you know, and, um, yeah, you know, and sometimes you have to reach the depths of hell before you're ready to try something, something yeah. different, you know, and so some of us are stubborn and you have to get to that place before you're ready to say, hey, maybe this guy, uh, this Ray dude is not so crazy like I first thought. Yeah. Um, one more thing I want to touch on for the blood work was uh, T3. So mm -hmm. I think that that's a common, uh, it's well, it actually it's well known that keto and low carb can suppress your T3 production. Um, and I tuned into a, two, a few videos a few days ago from people in the keto space who were saying that like, it's okay to have lo low T3. It's like your body, uh, it's a protective mechanism so that your body doesn't eat itself necessarily. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. um, and so can you kind of provide some benefit? Like what is the benefit of having high T3? <laughs> So this gets confusing, but like, uh, I kind of have a, uh, bone to pick with the T3 tests because yeah. a, for a long time I went to a doctor and he was kind of, this was a, this was like 10, this was like 2008 or something. And I would go to this doctor and he'd be like, you're free. I, I thought I had hypothyroidism for a long time, like way before I ever found out who Ray Pete was. Yeah. And I would go to these doctors and they would, they were like in the know and they would test free T3 and free T4 yeah. and occasionally even reverse T3. But the, the doctor would look at my free T3 and he'd be like, Danny, it's like perfect. It's like really close to the, the high end of the range. But I'd be like, this, this is crazy because I, all, I have like complete hypothyroid symptoms. Yeah. And so that would send me off in all sorts of weird directions. And then later, you know, I think Ray has pointed to evidence that makes a compelling case that those, uh, the total T3 and the free T3s, in my estimation, are pretty much worthless for assessing the rate of metabolism. Those tests that I, uh, we talked about before, the prolactin, the total cholesterol, the TSH to a lesser extent, even the parathyroid hormone, and especially the temperature and pulse. Yeah. I would think of those tests as like thyroid test par excellence, you know? Yeah. And I, I just, I don't even ask people to get those free T3, free T4s, because I think they're misleading and almost useless. Also, a lot of times they're expensive. Yeah. If you wanted to get a, like a specific thyroid test, the reverse T3 would be pretty good because I think the higher that is, the more hypothyroid a person would be and the more cortisol. But I've heard that argument, you know, oh, it's so good to have low T3 because of longevity or whatever. And I, I do not subscribe to that, those types of things. Oh, well, we're like a person or this group of people had low T3. So I'll just deal with this ridiculously low body temperature, cold feet, cold hands, cold genitals, like these torturous symptoms because of the Hunza or something, some bullshit like that. Like it's, th that's just, that's just a weirdo way of looking at health stuff to me now that it's just completely uncompelling. Yeah. I mean, I, so I had really low T3, uh, all throughout my low carb and carnivore journey. Um, and again, I was convinced that like, that wasn't a problem. I wish I would have had these other markers done. Um, but there's, was, there's was so many blood markers that were just pointing that my, my thyroid <laughs> was shot given all of my lifestyle factors. Um, and I just, I wish I would have had a Ray Pete bioenergetic lens back then, but like you said, like <laughs> everyone has to go through their journey, um, and you can never force someone to discover what health really is for them. That really has to come through their own journey. And I, I'm thankful for my previous experience because I don't think that I would have had the like outlook on what is health that I do today. Um, and I'm still like point like I'm still not 100% healthy because I don't have my period yet I'm I I had 12 years of amenorrhea so like 12 years digging myself in a stress hole and then I added in fasted exercise being super lean zero carbs like added just more and more stress into that and so it's going to take me a while to get out of it but I still don't have one of my health metrics which is a normal functioning period and I think that that's a really important uh metric for females that some people are saying just doesn't even matter, which is <laughs> it's insane to me because that's just like not optimal living. But I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. I want to hopefully make a point here. I don't think anybody is healthy. I think it's almost impossible to be healthy in the environment we live in. Yeah. We live in such a toxic environment. We are just 
surviving. You know what I mean? We all went through the most stressful, presumably years of our lives last year. Yeah. We're half, half a year later, we'll, we're still in it and there's no end in sight. And the news seems to be this hodgepodge of just darkness. You know what I mean? And, but that it's not to say that things just got stressful last year. Like things have been bad for a long time, you know, and our culture is sick, which breeds sick people, you know, and, and, and so many things would have to improve before there was a society of healthy people. And I'm not saying here, Oh, look how great my health is. You know, I compared to re relative to Danny in 2007, yeah. I've, come, I've come a long way. You know, I'm like, I'm amazed I'm alive. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and so I think that's the best gl glasses or optics to, to think about just your, yourself and how you feel and trying to improve that situation. But the, the environment, sucks we're being irradiated just talking to each other on zoom right now i'm I, a tr car goes by and sometimes i breathe in the exhaust you know it's just this is about as far as a fr from an ideal situation as you could possibly imagine you yeah that, that's a i think that's a great point to like and that is it is really hard to have perfect health these days because we are being bombarded by chemical toxins so our agriculture system is a hot mess yeah. with all of the pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, like all of that gets, even if we're buying organic food, like that's in our water, that's in, like we're exposed to that more than we know. It's in our air. Um, so there's the chemical side, then there's all of the EMFs and there's no escaping those now with 5G and it's, we're being bombarded on so many different levels that it's near impossible to give yourself perfect health. But this is kind of the premise of the pro-metabolic approach is we now have unavoidable stressors, like unavoidable stressors. We all live really stressful lives. We're trying to do 10 different things and build businesses and, and do all of these things. We have unavoidable stresses. Why put avoidable stresses on top of that? There are ways that we can work around certain stresses that we could inflict on ourselves, which can be avoided such as excessive fasting and things like that, where we're already getting hormesis from all of these other things in our environment. <laughs> yeah, I, there's a quote from Ray, and I, I don't want to, this is just a, par, a paraphrasing it. I don't want to butcher what he said specifically, but it's almost like hormesis has no concept in, in uh, th this point in everybody's life. Like you don't need to worry about <laughs> whether you're inducing stress. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. In fact, it happened probably when you were born, whatever happened at the hospital, whatever your parents ate, whatever your grandparents ate, like that transgenerational inheritance of stress is a, is a real thing. And so that that's just one of the popular ways to risk, misunderstand what Ray is saying. And so I, I think if a person did hold that belief, they should go check out uh, Hans Selye's books, uh, Stress Without Distress, yeah. The Stress of Life, because um, to be honest with you, I did not understand almost anything Ray was saying when I first kind of got into his work. And I went back and perused those books and I was like, oh, I pick out a little nugget here, pick out a little nugget here. And it made everything he was saying way easier to understand, you know? And so, yeah. The, and the one other thing we, we've talked about fasting multiple times here. I used to do like 23 hour fasts. I would do the one meal a day type of thing when I was carnivore right. and my temperature would just plummet during that fast. I'd be getting colder and colder and colder. Yeah. Until I was like ravenous for my meal, eat it, get a little bit warmer most of the time, and repeat. Yeah, it was just good. And then repeat. Yeah, yeah. Every I did that for like two years. Yeah, the, every day. And I, I know people might accuse me of cheating or something. I, I could stick to any diet perfectly. You know, I at that time I was the most dogmatic person you've ever met in your entire life. There, there was no slipping up. There was it would just not eat. You know, if if I couldn't get meat or something, and so. Yeah. Um, these days I have to find satisfaction in the food I eat, but not, not Danny of yesteryear. Yeah. And I don't want to end this conversation on like a negative note. It's just, like, <laughs> it's just accepting where we are as a society. We are bombarded by stressors every single day. Um, and no one is saying that like we can avoid all stress. Like it's just a function of living. Yeah, yeah. Um, Han Selye said uh, to avoid stress is death. Like that, that's not the point either. These stresses in our lives are unavoidable. Yeah. Good point. But doing these tests at like the at home tests and lab work and things like that can, can tell you whether or not you're kind of in a really stressed state, which is affecting your thyroid and your metabolism. And if so, 
you can make measures to improve that so you can enjoy your food and enjoy life a little bit more. I love that. And also only if you were having problems with keto or carnivore or whatever you're eating, right. if, a, if a person says, Hey, I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. Why should I change anything? I would never try to convince them to change. You know what I mean? It, it's only when you're having these horrendous problems and you're kind of locked into a dietary ide- ideology or something, and it's, it's, you're not moving in a favorable direction. Yeah. I think this, this paradigm, whatever you want to call it, the stress or thyroid or Repeat or whatever is um, has some answers to develop a toolbox of things to try to feel better in this terrible environment that we live in. Never feel guilty that you aren't following a diet guru's advice. Like if some if you're doing something that some influencer or someone is saying is like what you have to do to be healthy and you don't feel good, that's okay. Like you can make changes. It, it's okay. And as you and I both know, behind the curtain, many diet gurus are not doing well. And so that, that is something else to point out. You know, I've, I started a blog in like 2007. I've talked to lots of people in the health world. I would define a very small percentage of those people as actually healthy. Again, I'm not saying, oh, look at me. I'm the most healthy person imaginable. But there are some obvious deficits in people's rigidness and, and things like that that are, are really problematic. So, yeah. Yeah, great point. All right. Well, thanks, Danny. Where can people find you? Uh, T.me slash Danny Rowdy is probably the best place. That's the Telegram. I have like an Instagram, Instagram, the Danny Rowdy weblog um, on YouTube, but who knows how long that will last. Uh, I'm on all the things. You can type Danny Rowdy. Yeah. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Well, thanks, Danny. We'll have to get you back on soon. Anytime. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Danny about health and simple ways to assess your health. I do want to add a few things that we forgot to touch on when we were talking about simple blood work that you can get done to assess your health. I think another useful test would be the CRP, C-reactive protein test to assess your inflammation levels. We obviously want that to be low. And then also your fasting glucose and your A1C levels. I think that that would be a good indication as to how your metabolism is working and how well you're using glucose. So maybe add those to your next blood work as a really simple way to assess how your body is functioning right now. So I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. And again, if you haven't hit the like and subscribe button, make sure to do that now. And until next video, behave like an angel.